reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, beginning with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the kings will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever seen the sculpture that looks like a life-sized park bench with a sort of nondescript person lying on it, shrouded in loose clothing, or maybe it's a blanket, it's kind of hard to tell. This is one of those things that I had to ask Jen, is this a Canadian thing or (laughs) do people here know what I'm talking about? Well, you can imagine it. It looks from a distance, it looks realistic. It looks lifelike. Looks so lifelike that you wouldn't know it was a sculpture. It could be any person suffering from homelessness on any park bench in any town or city where that's a problem. It's not an uncommon sight. The person is seemingly unidentifiable, face covered in an attempt perhaps to keep the sun and wind out of their eyes so they can get some sleep, or maybe covered out of shame, a desire to remain anonymous in this helpless state in which they find themselves. But if you get a little bit closer and take a bit of a closer look, you will notice one identifying feature. Large gashes, gaping wounds on the tops of both of the homeless person's bare feet. The nondescript, anonymous, run-of-the-mill homeless person on the bench is, in fact, Jesus. The gash is a clear indicator that this one, 
who could so easily be any other, is, in fact, the crucified one. When the moment of recognition takes place, there is, at least for me, the first time I saw it, a moment of shock, realization, and then guilt. If I had known it was you, Lord, I would have done something. And that is just the point of the sculpture, but it's also the point of our scripture today, which the sculpture is intended to be a visual representation of. If I had known it was you. The sculpture by Canadian artist Timothy Schmaltz and our scripture today, which inspired it, make me what I call squirmy. <laughs> they make me squirmy because I feel called out by them. I feel like the sculpture and the scripture expose some personal shortcomings that I'm not really sure how to address or even if I am ready or willing to address. Our scripture today depicts a day of judgment when Jesus in his full and risen glory comes to put things right by exposing what has gone wrong. Where the nations are called to give an account for the ways that they have lived and what they have done and failed to do. The passage is not describing something that has already taken place or that is currently taking place. It is looking ahead to the culmination of time when all will be put right. It is describing things, it is describing what things will look like when the kingdom of God is fully established. And in that sense, this passage is a warning. It is a warning that someday things are going to be put right. And we are asked to examine our lives and actions so we can get on board with God's vision of justice here and now. In describing this future of putting right, Jesus describes two types of people, here symbolized by goat and sheep. First, Jesus addresses the sheep who represent the righteous. No offense to goats. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, Lorianne. <laughs> Those who have lived lives that match up with the kind of justice that will be found in God's kingdom. Come you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was a str stranger and you welcomed me, so on and so forth. Interestingly, the people, these righteous people, are surprised to learn about this. They are surprised to be told that they are inheritors of the kingdom because they have cared, because they have cared for Jesus. They rack their brains trying to remember, when did I do that? Hmm, I don't remember that. And that is when Jesus provides the key to this riddle. Just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. The people whom Jesus counts as righteous are those who lived in such a way that when they encountered human need or suffering or lack, they were compelled to care for their fellow human beings. Next, Jesus addresses the goats, representing here the unrighteous, or those who have lived lives that do not quite match up with the kind of kingdom that Jesus will inaugurate. To these, Jesus says, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus jumps right in here and tells them what the problem is. When he was hungry, they gave him no food. When he was thirsty, they gave him nothing to drink. When he was a stranger, they did not welcome him, and so on and so forth. The response of the goats is exactly the flip side of the response of the sheeps. sheep. excuse me. Where the righteous couldn't figure out what they had done to be lauded, the unrighteous can't figure out what they have done to deserve chastisement. When didn't we do these things, Lord? They demand to know. They are confident that their lives have been ordered according to the rules that would have them rewarded that would see them come out on top. They have very purposefully crossed all their T's and dotted all their I's, and they just cannot imagine when it was that they failed to do the right thing. And again, Jesus clarifies, 
just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. The unrighteous, the goats, are those who see the homeless man on the bench and do not get close enough to realize that he is, in fact, Jesus in their midst. If they had only known it was him, then they would have provided him with food, water, and shelter. But that is exactly Jesus' point. Caring for Jesus because he is the Son of God, the ruler of the universe, the one who will render judgment with the power to punish and reward, that's not the point at all. That is not the kind of righteousness that Jesus desires from his followers. In the kingdom of God, righteousness is not about earning favor from those in power. It's not about following the rules to get the reward. In the kingdom of God, righteousness is about justice. It is about seeing those in need as fellow human beings and offering them the cup of compassion, which is, in this case, um, very well, very likely, a literal giving of a cup of water to someone who is thirsty. This message of Jesus that calls us to be compassionate towards one another in our very human needs and frailty is a message that, in theory, I am fully on board with. Then again, the goats probably were too. But when I am confronted with what this means for me in concrete terms, I am made to feel, as I put it before, squirmy. Squirmy because how many times have I walked by someone begging on the street and not given them my spare change? How many times have I seen someone sleeping on a bench and though I feel sad and regretful that they are in that situation, I do not try to help them find shelter or a bed. Perhaps you can relate to having these kinds of experiences. I suspect if you can relate to that, that you can also probably relate to this line of thinking. Well, I can't help everyone. I don't have endless resources, and you know, you can't just approach people. You never know what they might do. They might be dangerous. And what if they just use the money for drugs or alcohol? What if they don't really need it and they're just scammers? No, not this time. Not today. This way of thinking is, I believe, a natural outcome of living in the world in which we live. It doesn't make us bad people to think these kinds of thoughts. We have seen and experienced and known enough to know that there are people who will take advantage of our kindness. That there is disingenuity in the world. That engage, engaging strangers can be dangerous. That even if we put a dollar bill in the hat, pot, or jar of every person we see begging on the street from now until the moment we die, we will not come anywhere near solving the problems of inequity and inequality and injustice in our world. So what's the point? In our world, in the real world, we have to think through these decisions. We have to be practical, and realistic, and use our resources wisely and diligently. And yet there is no denying that Jesus says to the goats, every time you did not feed, clothe, welcome, or visit one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. This scripture, speaking into our world, creates a squirmy tension that I cannot and will not attempt to resolve neatly. I cannot honestly say that I believe Jesus is calling us to give no questions asked to anyone and everyone who asks of us. And at the same time, I cannot say with any certainty that that isn't precisely what Jesus requires of us. This is a scripture that stands over against me personally, and many of us, I suspect, with judgment, and that probes us to think through our actions and the way we live our lives very seriously. It can lead us into hard and important conversations about what is the best way to help. Is it to give money directly to people or to buy them a meal or clothes instead of giving them money? Is it to save our money and give it to a charity that will help address things on a broader scale? Those are complex conversations that are worth having and that we will not settle today. 
But among these muddy areas and ongoing conversations, there are some things that Jesus is very clear about in our scripture today. It is clear that those whom Jesus counts as righteous are those who live in a way that compassion has become their reflexive response to others in need. Not compassion because it's what we're supposed to do or because we will look good if we are charitable or because we are trying to get on God's good side. But Jesus invites us into a way of seeing the world and the people in it through the eyes of compassion. Or to break down the word compassion, of suffering with. Because these suffering people are the very people for whom Jesus came to die. We often say in church that we want to be or try to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. When we say this, we usually mean that we try to emulate the kind, loving, and compassionate nature of Jesus in our relationships with others. This is a fine and good thing. But what our scripture today clearly teaches us is that those who are suffering and in need are like Jesus and are Jesus, too. If feeding a hungry person is really feeding our Lord, as he says it is in this passage, then Jesus is flipping the script yet again. Jesus is inviting us into a new and radical way of seeing and encountering one another and ultimately of being in relationship with God. What would it look like if this week you tried to envision every person you encounter as Jesus himself? And I'm not just talking about the suffering that you see on the news or if you're walking downtown in a city and see someone on the street. I'm also talking about your annoying neighbor and your controlling boss and that obnoxious guy who posts political stuff on Facebook. What would be different if you recognized every person as Jesus? I'm going to try my best to do this experiment myself this week, and I hope that you will join me in it. And the end of my sermon is on that stand. One moment. <laughs> or it's not. That's okay. I will wing it. Friends, when we, when we want to have the risen Christ in our life, when we want to be on the side of the Christ who has won victory over the grave, we have to also be on the side of the crucified Christ, the Christ who was rejected, the Christ who had his clothes stripped and lots cast for them, the Christ who is hungry on the cross, the Christ who had his friends betray him in his moment of need. If we do not serve that Christ in the eyes and in the faces of every person that we meet, then we do not get the glorious and risen and powerful Christ. They are one and the same. So this week, Keep your eyes open and see in every person you meet Christ right in front of you. Amen. Our song.